<laughs> well, so we have to do the discussions. Dr. Ahmed Jinapo, uh, he's a lecturer with the University of Education, Uriba. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, sir. Okay. And uh, it's been a while. Where yes. have you been? Well, I mean, uh, I've been, been up and down traveling. Uh, I'm not traveling as such, but been busy working at school and yeah, focusing on other stuff, things yeah. of interest. All right. Uh, let, let's look at some notable issues. And um, we know that there's um, the subject of feeding grants for senior high schools settled by government or the Ministry of Education. And the story is on page uh, 13 or 16 of the Ghanaian Times New Paper. It says government has released about 106.7 million Ghana cities to the Register of Scholarships for the payment of school feeding grant areas for senior high schools. And the money apparently is to settle the debt owed uh, uh, many of the schools, uh, especially captured in, in, in those areas in the three northern uh, regions. We have uh, the northern region itself, upper east and upper west. Uh, it, it's become a perennial problem, would you say, as an educationist? Well, uh, let me say good morning to your cherished uh, viewers. And uh, uh, I think uh, before I get to this issue, we are talking about education. Yes, and we are. You introduced me as somebody who works at the University of Education, Winneba. Uh, I think it's, it's proper to state that uh, the University of Education, Winneba, is one of the institutions in this country that has always been in the lead in terms of uh, human resource development, especially within the spectrum of education. Unfortunately, as we speak, and I speak as a stakeholder and somebody who happens to be a lecturer at that university, as we speak, we don't have a council. And as a result of that, it's affected so many things. Is it all tertiary institutions don't have a council? Well, all, uh, all, all tertiary institutions, because all uh, councils for tertiary institutions were dissolved. The unfortunate thing with regards to the University of Education Winneba is that it has a unique problem. That being, uh, where you have uh, these councils being dissolved, you have the chancellor who can always stand in for the, uh, for the council when it comes to graduate of what of students. So unfortunately for us, uh, uh, my understanding is that our, our, our chancellor is incapacitated. So as we speak now, even students who are supposed to graduate somewhere in April, they, they couldn't graduate, and you can um, understand the psychological trauma. But we've that's had some graduation ceremonies taking place. In other universities, and that's why I explained that when it comes to those universities, they have chancellors who are able to stand in because the law allows that. Unfortunately with us, our chancellor happens to be in That's the University of Education, education Winneba. Winneba. So I'll use this so platform. So you have a peculiar for, problem. Yes, so I'll use this platform and forum to appeal to the Minister for Education to expedite action when it comes to the formation of a council for that university because it's affecting a lot of things in that school. That said, when it comes to uh, this issue about school feeding, mm -hmm. I think... And uh, the grants. And the grants. Uh, we're talking look, mainly about the grants. Yeah, we're talking about the Not grants. Not necessarily school feeding, but about the, about the grants. About the grants, yeah. In senior high schools. Senior high schools. Senior high schools. I think, I think it's, 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 it's commendable. And, and, and Roland, uh, I think there needs to be a sustainable policy to address this issue. In the sense that, look, we are talking of four terms. That is one and a half or more than, more than a year because uh, when it comes to secondary schools, a, a year, an academic year is three terms. We are talking of four terms. Today, the amount that has been released, in as much as it's commendable, is just for two terms. It's just for two terms. As it stands now, when you go to northern Ghana, almost every school in northern Ghana today is not reopened because they don't have the, uh, the, the money to, uh, to pay their, uh, what do they call them, uh, people who have helped finance these programs. What this, what, what this means is that when it comes to uh, 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 schools in this country, schools in, southern, uh, 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 schools in southern Ghana, today as we speak, they are, they, 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 they are attending school, whilst those in Ghana, uh, northern Ghana happen not to, not to be at, uh, attending school. So I think there needs to be uh, uh, a program or there needs to be a, a, a strategy one way or the other to address this particular issue forever. It should not be happening every day, where every year, every term, we have a problem with what paying of what uh, grants to schools. I, I, I think uh, whether you like it or not, uh, what it means is that uh, I don't know, they, it raises a lot of questions when it comes to even the general program of uh, uh, free, free uh, ed education. Because if three, three regions, as it stands now, three regions have a problem with, with their feeding grants. And as a result, they've not been able to come to school. Just look at it when you apply to the whole country. So I think, I think it's unfortunate, uh, in as much as the government needs to be commended and applauded for, for, for doing this. Uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, we need to look at 
how this thing is not repeated, but it's also instructive to Steve Rolanda. Today you see in the, on the front page of the Ghanaian Times that government has released this amount of money. Parents, especially in the three northern parts of the country, are going to be interested in their children going to school. But you understand and appreciate the bureaucracy that these things go through. Uh, the money has been released to what scholarship secretariat or whatever agency it is. Uh, it has to go through the various uh, routes before it hits the accounts of what the individual schools, before even these uh, uh, suppliers are being given some money. So uh, they shouldn't expect that by tomorrow or tomorrow next, uh, schools are going to be opened. But my interest, yes. What they've done is commendable, but let's look at how we can prevent this uh, in, in future uh, occurrences. And we have also joining us Dr. Ali Dusedu. He is a, a political scientist, a lecturer with the political science department of the University of Ghana. Thanks for joining me, Ali Du. Thank you so mm. much. And we're talking about school feeding grants. Uh, now we're told paid for at least two terms or more for schools, senior high schools in the three uh, northern regions. For the whole, the whole country. The whole country, country. okay. But particularly, we know that. Um, uh, at least 73 of schools in the northern part of Ghana uh, had to um, postpone uh, or reschedule their reopening dates because of some of these difficulties. It, it, it's now become almost a perennial problem. We've been facing this, I believe, there's a fifth year running. Um, what do we need to do to show that level of commitment to these schools and these students? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I think. Education is one of the most crucial cornerstones for development, wherever you look at it. And this fact came out strongly in both the 2012 and 2016 elections. The whole issue about uh, free senior high and then uh, expanding infrastructures to provide access. All those things had to do with the fact that education is one of the most important uh, developmental variable in every society that you look at. So, if we are not able to address the, the needs and concerns of students, especially mm. those that, I'm not, not specifically those at the North, though they have faced majority of the challenge, then I think we are indirectly not being honest to ourselves. Mm. Because if you want to move this country forward through education and the knowledge, building a knowledge-based economy, suggests that you have to get the foundation right, and then you have to make sure that people who are qualified, who are deserving, it's, it's a basic right must be able to assess uh, this uh, valuable you knowledge like that will move them to the level that we want them to go. So I think that, like my uh, senior colleague said, we have to do away with the bureaucracy. We have to make sure that the right thing is done. It, it's something that you know is going to happen. So why don't you, it's a template, why don't you just program uh, ahead? You may say there are no resources, but at least you should be able to squeeze from other sectors mm. and then make provision for it. So I think the, we should be able to do away with the bureaucracy and then make sure that the right thing is done so that people go back to school. Because it, it seems defeatist if you have a policy that's supposed to encourage enrollment into education, that's supposed to make things free, and then a very basic component that's supposed to move them forward, the food that they're going to eat. And mind you, in some localities, this has been an incentive for people to even go to school. The, the feeding. So if, if you're not able to adequately tackle it, it's going to have a lot of uh, wider implications on our ability to, to assess education and to build a knowledge-based economy that can move this country to achieve our developmental visions. But, but, but you see, Roland, the, the point is this, uh, beyond, beyond just the payment of these uh, grants, I think it's instructive for us as a people to look at why did we get to this end? We're talking about four terms. I mean, four terms areas. That means a whole year, nothing was paid, and the beginning of what? Another year, another academic year, nothing was paid. So you're looking at four terms. How do we put a stop to this? And that is where I believe that at the end of the day, uh, it's not enough to pay such an amount. But let's take a serious look at our border system. Because here, when we talk of grants, we are talking of feeding grants. Mm. People need for to borders. be fed for borders. Uh, is, it, is it the time that we have to gradually shift from this whole boarding concept to what? Uh, I mean, uh, day schooling system, because it's not sustainable. If you look at the rate at which uh, the population is growing vis-a-vis -vis the rate of our economic uh, 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 development, expansion. expansion, I mean, it doesn't move in tandem. So as a people, is it the case that So are you saying that, let's say, uh, Ghana well, Secondary School or 
Now yes, Bongo secondary yes, school I mean, or Infante Pim or yeah, Chimbota, why, why, why should it which be have day students. Yeah, it should be majority day students, especially. <laughs> Look, listen, the fact of the matter is that the modern concept has its own benefits. Yes. But I don't yeah. understand why if, let's say, I'm a tutor at Ghana Secondary School, my son should be in the boarding school. It doesn't make sense. You understand what I'm saying? I live in that school. And my son happens to be what? But that's a, a peculiar situation. Even it beyond that. Even beyond that. It doesn't that. apply Let, to everybody. It does, it does, but let's look at, at the end of the day, you happen to be a, a, a medical doctor living in Tamale. Should your son necessarily be a boarder? I think we need to look at it. Because... But there are distractions in the environment. No, there, there are distractions. But we are looking at the costs associated with We are looking at 110 million Ghana cities for two terms for just three of... Of of uh, and this what is, is your subsidy? That, that is it. So if you if you look at it and and at the end of the day, if you look at what is going to happen with regards to this free SHS policy that is being rolled out, the whole fundamental pillar under which it's hinged on has to do with what community day schooling. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now now we're going mm. to be heavy on the expenditure side for senior secondary school and even from the next academic year. We know of course it's been budgeted etc. It's it's even going to be more financially exhausted. Um, does this suggest in any way that we should be preemptive and be thinking that, well, in the future, in the medium to long term, we will be having difficulties, especially expending on some of these expenditures? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a very expensive, even though a necessary uh, policy. I, I think you're referring to the free senior high yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. policy. In relation to how yeah, we're having... Yeah or struggling to pay feeding grants, for yeah, I, I think if it's very difficult for us to pay ordinary feeding grants, then it may be technically difficult for us to sustain a free senior high school over time. Because the feeding is just a component of the whole package that goes into the free senior high policy. So if we are going to find it difficult paying for just the feeding, then it is going to be difficult for us to pay for the other thing. But I also think that if, if government is really committed, mm. as, as is demonstrating, they should be able to, to do a lot of uh, rebudgeting and then can save from other sources. Mm. And, and that, that can actually help. Because I, I haven't, it has been a controversial issue where we're even going to draw the money from as a country to finance the whole policy of free senior high. But I think they should be able, because it's, it's, their, it's a policy, they should be able to find a way of paying for it. But my, my, my point of departure is that. I, I don't think we should sacrifice the whole concept of the boarding system in the name of uh, in, inadequate uh, resources. Mm. Because it is one of the foundation of uh, cohesive society building. Mm. And if you read a lot of the literature on conflict and communal conflict, people have usually said that if you move and live in, in a different part of the world other than where you were born, you are able to appreciate their culture, you are able to appreciate their way of living, and then you can be more tolerant than if you just sit somewhere and think people this in this part of the country are this and they behave that way. So it boosts that element of tolerance, that element of social cohesion. And people believe that has been one of the serious variables that have held this country all these years. We've been able to go to do elections without killing each other. Because it's been won. Because you are really going to appreciate the whole concept of me against them, uh, me being uh, superior and somebody's inferior. That bridge is, is that gap is bridged in the names of, of uh, this whole concept of border. So we should find a way, even if you be in, out, out, or something, to retain that that element of of the policy of uh, a border system, and then find a way to to finance the other components. You went to a boarding school yourself? No, I didn't. Okay, didn't. yeah, I was a day student to at Ghana mm -hmm. Secondary School. Mm -hmm. you, you know the interesting the interesting thing about this whole boarding debate is uh, it's a debate that we can have at length, but. The argument that I'm trying to make here is if you look at our resources, mm. if you look at how uh, this country has developed in terms of, uh, I mean, how the cultural and diversity that we have today, and the accessibility, and, the accessibility to and stuff like that, it's something that we seriously have to take a look at. Because I, I think mean, if you look at even most of these countries that have been engulfed in civil wars and civil unrest, I mean, boarding system happens to be there. <laughs> you understand? You go to Liberia, you go to Ivory Coast, they practice the boarding system. And still, they had all these problems. Today, as we speak, it's easier for me to more or less interact with somebody in Bolga, I mean, through internet and whatever it is, and through movement and stuff like that than as it used to be before. I quite remember when I was at the university not too long ago, somewhere in 2000, this whole hostel system 
never existed. Everybody lived in a hall. But when you go to the University of Ghana, <laughs> the hostel system has taken over what? The whole hall concept. I mean, as human beings, we need to be what? I mean, proactive. And we, we have to be dynamic and move in accordance with the realities of what? Of what is happening in society. The truth of the matter is that the whole boarding system is used to be traditionally. It's not sustainable. It cannot be realistic, and it cannot be attained into Even in the advanced countries, those who are sent bonding yeah, school are, 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 are the, are the, the children of the rich. That is the fact. If you're not extremely that, rich. So, so where government have to pay for each and every individual who happens to be in a boarding school? We need to have everything. We need to look at it. I mean, why should government be paying for electricity, water, feeding, everything, and even bed? To the extent that mattresses have to be provided, I think we need to take a serious look at it. And uh, that is where we need to be moving towards. But at the end of the day, my interest is that, look, yes, uh, education is an important asset which can never be put aside. And government definitely will have to look for resources to what? To, to more or less address it. But there are also some very, very important concerns and some very important needs that government cannot do away with. And that is where we have to be pragmatic in how we raise funds to deal with these issues. Okay, now let's move on to the subject of the issues of politics and uh, uh, political economy and, uh, and what affects um, the politics of our time. The New Patriotic Party, they, they um, uh, went through or convened what they call the National Executive Council meeting uh, yesterday. And at the council meeting, they came out with certain resolutions. And uh, for example, they said all party uh, office holders who are in government need to make way for some interim appointments to be made. And then among uh, some of the issues they fixed was that there's going to be a national delegates conference for the 25th to the 27th of August 2017. And they also approved the party's hosting of uh, a number of activities. But they also, the president was there, addressed them. But the meeting expressed strong disapproval and regret against the actions and utterances of the Minister of Gender, children and uh, social protection. Uh, we'll come for your comments, but we'd want to get uh, the audiovisual or the report on, on what the, the meeting was all about. ...of the governing MPP just ended, and we have dignitaries coming out of the, of the meeting hall, and just behind me is the president uh, with the acting chairman of the New Patriotic Party just exiting, I mean, from the conference room here at the Alisa Hotel. The meeting took a little over four hours. Meeting started a little after 7 p.m. and it is past 11. The meeting ended just about a few minutes ago, actually a marathon meeting, uh, considering the fact that it is the National Council meeting of the governing party and the president is having a chit chat with some executives of the governing NPP. And there you have it, President Kufuado is taking leave of executives and council members here at the Alisa Hotel. Now, let's head straight to the Acting General Secretary, John Buedu, as far as this all important National Council meeting of the governing NPP is concerned. Can you tell us a bit of what issues were touched on in no, there? I have told you that a formal statement will be issued tomorrow morning. And that will include everything that was discussed. Before this important meeting, you mentioned that uh, disciplinary issues were going to be among the key issues. Did it come up? Yes, it did. And which issues we are were not going to get any answer further than what I've said. I'm saying that a formal statement will be issued by me tomorrow morning. And you have all that you want. Mm. Mm. The reason, as I told you, is that there are other things that some other people must do in order for me to capture as Will a statement, statement of yours. Yes. Okay. So what time exactly are we Oh, tomorrow, at? latest by 10, the statement will be out. We've had a very good meeting. Mm. We've had a very, very good meeting. So did this meeting impact the performance of... That's what you see in the statement. Mr. So Mr. Take a decision on that. Yeah. How will this meeting I mean, impact the performance of government? Is it going to have any impact on That's government performance? of the meeting in the first place. Mm. So it will have a great impact on, on the running of our government. Far-reaching decisions were made. And 
Just wait tomorrow morning. How about the party? How about the party? How about the, how about the party? How about the party? How about the party? How about the party? It's a combination of two. Mm. The government and the party. So tomorrow morning, you, you have the statement. Don't worry. Don't so Ghana should expect a reshuffle. It, it, it turned out to be a marathon meeting, would you say? Well, we to my it's even a after seven. So my even so I finished too early. But the issues involved, and that's why you see everybody laughing and smiling because we 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 discuss into much details of all the issues that we raise, and there was unanimity in the discussion. And I think that it is good. That's the best that we can have, and expect a very good statement tomorrow morning. <laughs> And this report was captured the evening of Wednesday, and we have a statement. And I read uh, before we took that insert or so that story a number of the pointers in the statement uh, that all party office holders elected uh, who have second executive positions, that is in government, they should vacate their party positions. And then the meeting also expressed strong disapproval and regret against the actions or not transfers for the uh, between the agenda minister and the northern region. Uh, chairman of the party, that's the MPP. Now, uh, I start with you. Um, uh, early governance showers for the MPP. Well, I don't understand what you mean by early okay. governance showers. Uh, and, and a plethora of issues before they even convene this National Executive uh, Council meeting. Well, I mean, I'm tempted to believe that uh, probably if you look at the issues that were discussed and what came out of the mm. meeting, uh, with reference to they having a the Congress, uh, they hosting, I think, uh, an um, international program that they are supposed to host. Uh, it looks as if the MPP as a political party already had this meeting planned. Okay. And uh, maybe the, uh, the timing probably could have more or less been preempted by this whole Otiko. Just coincidence? Uh, uh, no, I mean, not necessarily coincidence, but maybe because of that, they could have fast-tracked the meeting to, okay. to, to get it rolling. But, Roland, to be honest with you, I think uh, this whole brawl between Otiko and and uh, Bukri Nabu has just been a waste of time for Why? the good people of this country. I mean, it's unnecessary. It was very unnecessary. Look, they've had a lot of bashing. Uh, they've come up publicly to apologize. I mean, I'll take their word for it and give them the benefit of that for them to more or less uh, not to conduct themselves the way they conducted themselves uh, again in future. Uh, that is it. Apart from I don't see anything that comes out of it. It's just been a waste of people's time. It really did not show and demonstrate a sense of maturity on the part of both of them. But what is instructive out of this meeting, and I don't know whether uh, the individuals who happen to be part of this meeting thought through it. What they are saying is that if you happen to be in government, you cannot hold, what do they call it, an executive position mm -hmm. in the party. Mm -hmm. You understand? That means automatically, automatically, Otiku Jaba ceases to be what? The national women organizer. And what it also means is that there are so many people who were appointed from party, who held party positions by the Nanado administration. For instance, regional chairmen, secretaries. It means automatically they seize their positions. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? And that needs to be enforced. Because I know a number of regional chairmen who happen to be regional ministers and ministers. I know a number of constituency secretaries, chairpersons who happen to be what? DCs. Yeah. What it means is that automatically their positions need to be seized. Secondly, moving forward, if you happen to be in government or even you occupy any position, like a chief executive officer or whatever it is, it means you cannot contest for what? A party position. Because immediately you contest for a party position, automatically you have to relinquish one. To relinquish one. And that is where I find it quite intriguing because I've heard a couple of people who have expressed interest. For instance, the deputy uh, national service uh, uh, coordinator, the director, uh, one, some, uh, one, this lawyer, is it? Nana B. I mean, yeah. is this Nana B? He's not a lawyer, though. Oh, he's not a lawyer, okay. Mm -hmm. He has expressed interest in what? In becoming the youth organizer or whatever it is. Yeah, one of those. What it means is that automatically he has to what? The language his position as what? The deputy. That is if he wants to. No, if he does. If mm -hmm. he goes in and he wins, he has to. So it has far reaching implications. I, I, I don't know if because of this behavior put up by these two individuals has led to the coming up of this decision and they really looked through the consequences and ramifications moving forward because it's never been a policy of that sort historically. I think it came about as a result of this. But look, as I said, 
Uh, my understanding is that uh, Madam Otiku has uh, uh, issued, is asked to issue a written apology and to sign a bond of good conduct. Uh, Mr. Bugrin Abu is also supposed to do the same. Uh, I hope, I hope uh, other individuals in government positions and important positions will take inspiration from this moving forward. Mm, but let's, let, let's take the issues as they come, eh, because they discuss a number of issues. Now, let's take this dispute, or perhaps mm. a spat, mm. between uh, the women's organizer, who is the Minister for Gender, and then also the uh, Northern Region Chairman of the party, who, as an individual himself, during the electioneering, was also a force to be reckoned with in many ways. Contributed or feels that he contributed heavily to the winning of the party uh, by a landslide in the last election. W were there some undercurrents, or perhaps what could be some of the socio-economic or psychological mm -hmm. uh, undercurrents that could inform some of these perhaps personality clashes in many ways? I, I think uh, what's going on between uh, Madame Otiko and then. Uh, Bugunabu is an interesting thing to be political scientists because uh, two important definitions of politics can take care of this. The first is what is provided by Laswell, how Laswell, who said that politics is defined as who gets what, when, and how. The, it all has, if I'm alone, there's no politics. I can do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, and how I want to do it. But once I'm more than one, then there's the whole thing of politics because people will be demanding things or be computing for resources which are very limited. So the issue is that the, the, the type of uh, political system that we practice leads to technical what's known as the spoils system. In traditionally, when you go to war and you win, you take what belongs to you the enemy. You have to share the spoils. And then they sh you share. So it's, it's the same thing translated into politics. Even before this government was sworn in, we saw people who personally took what they thought belonged to them or were taken away from them. Season, uh, what is it, public toilets, toll booths, locking up uh, national health insurance offices and all those things. So it, it is all about the definition of politics. So Madame Otiku Jaba played a crucial role as the national women's organizer. The Northern Regional Minister did a lot and he made a lot of gains for the, the MPP, chairman. sorry, chairman in Northern Region. So now, who influences what? Who can speak to the, who can have the listening ear of the president? Who can make a recommendation for the president to pick? So I think basically it, it, it has to boil down to one particular issue of who is supposed to control the school feeding or be the coordinator of the school feeding program in, in the northern region. So the issue was that the assumption has been that people uh, bribed or paid money to the northern regional minister to, to put their names forward. And then the gender minister also had her favorite candidates. So it, it, does, it, it, it all boils down to that particular single definition of politics. We, we have all contributed our part. So who should benefit? And how should that person benefit? But the other has to do with David Easton's definition of politics, uh, the authoritative allocation of values. Mm. In every governance system, there should be values. Values are very controversial. Is it personal or collective? Each one of us have our personal value systems. That may not necessarily sync with the collective value system. So as somebody in government or a public position holder, you are expected to put up a certain behavior that matches or conforms to a specific <coughs> ethical value or system. So the issue is that who defines that collective value system? And how are we able to do away with our individual value system and then move on to the level of the generic? So I was thinking that if there was anything that was untoward, or if the regional minister, not the regional, was not even happy even about chairman. the disc sorry, chairman, I would say regional minister, about what, what was happening on at a modern city hotel, I, I think the approach that was you wasn't right. Okay. That, that's one. But the whole media war that started was the bad form of a, pers a what is it, a public How does this holder. affect the party and the public opinion <coughs> Uh, of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 every party, the NDC, sorry, the MPP, for example, has a collective general behavior. Especially if you are in government, as a party, they have a general behavior that should guide their standard of living. But even if you are in government, it moves beyond just the party. So if people are putting that behavior that is contrary to the assumed value system of the party or the government of the day, definitely the perception about the government is going to be something negative. I, I, I don't think this is not going to affect the government, not in voting terms, but people's perception 
about about things. So I, I was reading a Facebook comment and somebody said, you you refused a, a car bribe and the money and you are taking gold and then, you know. So people are able to, to make a lot of meaningful utterances and, and interpretation to what just happened. And, and even linking this whole thing to what happened to the upper West regional minister and all, you know, most of these things were out of context. So you see that everybody has something that can be used against the other. Mm. And once you start fighting this way, you are going to say a lot of things that you didn't intend to say. Okay. And that will have a lot in of moving forward, is it because people are feeling insecure? Because now people have been put in their, their right position. Somebody is having a position. Um, people are taking up uh, various responsibilities. And so there could be some fear of insecurity or perhaps uh, people's powers uh, are being reduced in many ways. And so some level of insecurity creeping in. Well, I mean, uh, Roland, before I answer that question, I don't think anybody who has followed these two individuals uh, was one way or the other surprised about their behavior. Are you speaking I mean, from a personal experience? No, I mean, and I'll give you a typical example. So, I mean, if you look at the temperament and public utterances of these two individuals, mm -hmm. they are the type that they never will give up to a fight, if you quite remember. <laughs> when they did the election, he said that there were a number of people who voted for Alan Tremate, and he was looking for them, mm -hmm. if you remember. That's you mean based on his public utterance? No, and his behavior. He said he was looking for them. And he even went further to say that, look, they wanted Northern Region to give Nanado 100%, but they were beaten by what? Upper West, because some few individuals voted for Alan Martin. So he wanted them out. If you quite remember, during the electionary period, the, is it the regional women organizer had a feud with him, yeah. and he sacked the lady from what? <laughs> from the party. Yeah. So this... He's a very good friend of mine. I like him so much. I mean, we have personal relationships. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah, my very good friend. I mean, we call each other and stuff like that. I see him as my father, but he's an autocrat. That's the fact. You can't run away from it. Bugri Nabu is one who believes that, look, uh -huh. he's the regional chairman. Everything in the region needs to pass under him. And he needs to give his blessing but and right approval. So. I don't know. I'm not giving My party uh, strategy. No, I don't know what it is. But here we are talking of what? A national woman organizer who happens to be a minister of state, who goes in and organizes what a meeting, and she believes that by virtue of her ranking in the party, she doesn't need approval from the regional what, chairperson. So it boils down to power play. Who is more powerful? That's what I it is. She even says she, she had permission from the regional minister. The regional minister. Coming in as a yes. minister of and state. And that is where, that is where yeah. the confusion yeah. is. That is where the confusion party is. And, and that government. Is party and government. Yeah, if we'll talk not, about that. Because if you are not able we'll to manage We'll talk about that in relation to the position if, that yeah, you are Yeah, if you are not able to manage Because he is saying that he asked permission from the regional minister. Mm -hmm. As a minister, does he need permission from the regional chairman? Probably not. But here is the case. She also happens to be what? A woman organizer. So you ask yourself, in what capacity was she organizing what? The meeting. Mm -hmm. Is it as a minister or as what? A, a, a party executive. But be it as it may. Look, my brother. At the end of the day, you ask uh, uh, Doc a uh, very instructive question whether this is going to affect the party or not. Look, as I said, it was an unnecessary what, uh, uh, altercation. At that time, the president was touring around what? West the, the West African region. This news more or less overshadowed his tour. Secondly, just yesterday, they had a meeting at Alisa Hotel. Did they give them the hotel for free? No, they paid money for that hotel. National security happened to go and what? Look around and see to all that everything was what said. It's taxpayers' money. You understand what I'm saying? So, because it's of the, the party's money. Well, whether it's the party's money, the president went there in a capacity yeah, as, president as the president of the Republic. Of the Republic. <laughs> there were soldiers guarding him, there were police, there were ambulances, and all those things. True, taxpayers Isn't it? It's taxpayers' money. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? So, I think that, look, at the end of the day, moving forward, if you are in a position, you need to be mindful of the position that you occupy. And you also have to take a deep reflection of yourself. Now look, today I am minister or chairman of whatever it is. So I need to be very, very careful. So I have to do way. a transition. That is it. <laughs> and that has always been the problem with most of mm -hmm. these, our politicians, especially in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. There's always a problem transitioning from what? Party to mm -hmm. what? Government. And look at even what happened. The, of course, this was a national council program that was organized. So the, uh, the general secretary of the MPP, undoubtedly has the right to, uh, to speak to this issue. But if you look at his statement that he issued, his statement covered and bordered on governance. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It bordered on governance. Who shouldn't be so? Because he's not a member of government. You understand? If there's any kind of issue relative to the Minister of Gender, 
that needs to come from government, not from what? A party executive. But, I mean, we are mm. moving forward as a, as, a, as a people. I mean, we are growing as a country in terms of our now politics we'll and stuff. And we need to learn as fast as now, possible. Now, with that, in finality, um, apologies coming from both sides. Of course, they, they've, dis, they've, they've, fallen, they've, fall, they've stopped <coughs> short of um, apologizing to each, each other. other. Yeah. Okay? But before the apology, some serious statements have been mm. made, which mm. border on many issues of, of subjects of uh, court of law. Uh, subject of people's individual integrity, etc. Does the overall apologies from both sides uh, perhaps bring a certain finality, overshadow what were what, the things that were said within these parts? Ap apology is a very controversial mechanism to mm. burden reconciliation. People may apologize verbally. One, it can be done on a willing basis, or you can be forced to do it. These are two different things. Even where you do it on voluntary basis, you may say it but not act it. People may act regret or remorse, but, but not saying or apologizing verbally. So it depends. I, I think a lot of things has been said, as you've mentioned. And the fact that they have not even apologized to each other shows that they're still keeping all the bad things that were said about them in, in public. So I think moving forward, they have to, it should be sincere, you know. If, if you apologize as a result of sincerity, it's, 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 it may be sustainable than if you are forced to, to do it because you are bringing the and name of the And in this sense, it looks like they were forced to do it. Of the political party into disrepute. Because I, I think if it was personally, they, they would have been able to apologize to each other rather than to the president and the government and the harm they brought to them. But not to the persons they were attacking. Sorry, not to the individual you were attacking. And and Roland, this is very instructive. I think the 1992 Constitution has a chapter I can't remember, which talks about co code of conduct for public officials. And I remember when the NDC government was in power, they also drew up a code of conduct. You see, once you get to a certain level in public office, your conduct must speak volumes of the type of person you are and of the group you belong to. If you do anything contrary to this. Is going to have a lot of implications. And then how do we move forward as a party, as a government, as a people uh, beyond this and say that the apologies have been accepted and whatever they've said, perhaps uh, we can just write them off? Well, I, I, I mean, they, they've been asked to sign a bond of good conduct. I think that alone is enough. Uh, what I think comes out of this, and which is quite worrying, and even though it's marks of uh, politics, is the allegation that was made by Mr. Bugrinabu relative to the death of uh, yeah. Mr. Adams. Yeah. I think that was a, 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 a serious statement to make, even though he made it at a time that he was more or less angry. Mm. Uh, I can be angry with you, Roland, and uh, if I say something about you, it tells you that, look, I, I have some information. Mm -hmm. I think that was the, 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 low, point. the low point of this whole, this whole uh, 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 fracas. And I would really wish that the, 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 the state agencies uh, look yeah. at it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it shouldn't, I, it shouldn't I, be swept under oh, the carpet. Really? I think no, so, too. I, I yeah, think, yeah it, shouldn't, so. it shouldn't be, uh, what do they call it, uh, politicization. Because if, if uh, I have a confusion with, uh, 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 with Doc and we happen to be friends, then out of that anger, he makes the statement that, look, you, you, you referred to this person purposefully. That means there's some iota of truth yeah. Yeah. in it. And a statement of that sort where he makes mention of a regional minister, he makes mention of a city minister, and we are talking of what? I, I, I support the, the minority. I something needs to be done. That, 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 yeah. that, the, the, the minorities, minorities call, call that, that some, yeah. something should that be done. That the Look, Ola, even if I'm angry with you, yeah. I wouldn't make pronouncements that I don't have basis to make. Meda, my brother. Meda. Especially when it has to do with Meda. It's, it's, I think it's, so. It's, okay. it's unfortunate. Uh, good that you're not security people, but let's move on. Um, <laughs> since 1992, <laughs> since 1993, we've had um, transitions from mm. government, uh, one party to the other in government. And um, I always see, based on since I started practicing in 2001, I've, I've, I've seen that the parties and the personalities and the individuals who hold executive positions tend to have a hard time trying to manage that transition when they are into government. Not in terms of behavior, but in terms of how, if you're in government, but you're a party person, the relationship with the people, 
with the state and even with the individual parties. What, why do we have that phenomenon? Or have we experienced all that? And we're witnessing it in this instance too. I don't understand. It's like when you are moving from yes, opposition when you are from, to government. When, you are in, when you, let's say you are in opposition yeah. and you come into government, mm -hmm. you have to leave your executive positions because everybody is scrambling for the spoils, as you yeah. say. Now, why do we have that phenomenon of everybody goes into government and then it's as if the, party, <coughs> the party's livelihood li um, hinges mm -hmm. on some level of hibernation and uncertainty? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, or perhaps the the party, as in government, is more functional than the party, as a party. Yeah, if if you read the what's the name, the uh, work done by uh, Dr. Bob Miller on on party activism in Ghana, he talks about the fact that uh, most of the things that people do, support for party, vigilantism, uh, contribution, everything that is 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 interpreted as a form of investment. You see, even putting all up, that, if even putting up investing, yourself, yes, people say it that way. <laughs> so you are having a rally. I'm a macho man. You hire me. I go and snatch okay. a ballot box. I see that as an investment, and I will definitely Want would reward. demand a reward when you come to government. I see. That is why people had the authority. Or what, what was the name? Something forces. Invincible, yeah. Invincible forces. forces, and then the Delta forces yeah. thought that they had sacrificed their life for the party when they were in opposition. And for that matter, they need to be rewarded for it. So regardless of the acts you put forward, you see it as an, as an investment. People selling their properties, personal properties, to contest for a party executive position. It's a form of investment with the intention that my contribution towards the party, or people giving out money, no uh, sponsors uh, giving so much money to government or uh, sorry to political parties to it's a form of investment if you come to power my business will get a lot of deals if you come to power as an individual i get promoted or, so all these things has to do with that element of thing so where these expectations are not met you're going to see a whole lot of misbehavior coming up from them and the president is also very cognizant of this fact so sometimes it it, it can influence the appointments that he makes you may see that this person will have been very competent for this position, but he doesn't get it because maybe somebody paid higher than him or somebody made and be, say, be, better investment. And, and Let me say, put it that way. If you say pay, you mean the level no, of Not money, yeah, investment. Mm. Somebody invested mm. in effort, resources, or knowledge. Could be transient, could yes, be physical. Yes, more than okay. that particular person. So it, it is very difficult managing these things. And once you are not able to do that, then you are going to start facing challenges from day one. And so we've had our two parties who, which have been in government. Both NDC and them. NDC have, have, faced, faced. have faced those challenges. So sometimes, all I see, somebody, they were appointed and say, he's not a party person, he's not a grassroots person. Yes, he wasn't mounting campaign and talking, but he was making a form of investment that was not visible at the time of the campaign. So his word comes out when the party wins elections. So this, uh, and the NDC and MPP have faced it. And if you are not able to manage it very well from day one, it's going to continue reoccurring to the time that people use it against you in an elections. And, and because they have large following, de facto, we are two-party system. Even though constitutional, we are supposed to be a multi-party system. So even people deciding to go to NDC or MPP or even support PPP, it's a form of investment. Because if I'm with PPP, I'm more likely to be a national chairman than if I go to NDC or MPP. If I support NDC or MPP, there's a likelihood that maybe in the next four or eight years, I can be in government. So these are all choices. And when people do these rational calculations and their investment don't gain any reward, you're going to expect all these things to occur. Now, at the end of the day, um, you see that it's at the detriment of the consolidation of the party structures, even when they are supposed to be at their peak, that is, if they are in government. And so that is why perhaps maybe you see some kind of um, psychological complexities when they lose election all of a sudden, when they didn't think they would lose. But then you see that the party apparently, based on its structure, is quite hollow. Yeah, because uh, at the end of the day, the reason being that uh, in this country, our democracy is still not uh, entrenched. Mm -hmm. In the sense that if you go to some of the advanced countries that uh, we see them as models of what democratic coping, uh, it doesn't work like that. Why am I saying this? Scarcely will you get a national chairman of what? The Republican Party taking a position in government. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. 
under normal circumstances, all things being well, the party should be able to bring what? The party into government and people who happen not to even be affiliated to the party but have the capacity to run government then takes over what? The governance systems or what? Of the country. But it doesn't work that way. Even look at what is happening with regards to the appointment of deputy ministers under the uh, Leonardo administration. Most of them are MPs. Most of them are MPs. You look at uh, some of the ministerial appointments, most of them happen to be what? Uh, regional executives or national executives. If you look at uh, even the district chief executives, these are individuals. So what he's trying to do is that he wants to make sure that there's a fusion between what? Government and what? And the party. But here lies the case. The party also brings a, a certain fiat and says that relinquish your position. Yes. That, that is where, that is where the, the, that, that was why I was saying that, look, uh, I don't know if they thought through it mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. But I think moving forward, what do you should... Th what do you think that, that, that brings about? Well, I think, I think that you yeah. should relinquish your yeah. position if you are... Mm -hmm. if, because, look, if you happen to be a minister of state, let's say Utiku Jaba is minister for gender. When Utiku Jaba goes to Berlin, mm -hmm. NDC and NP people should be able to what? Come to her. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Especially the kind of ministry she's holding. Yes, very minister of ministry. gender and women affairs. Social Everybody should be able to come to you. But if you happen to be a constituency secretary and you are the DC, definitely you'll be more involved in party activities. So I think this is long overdue. But Roland, I'm looking at a time where in this country, people are voted into power based on their policies and programs. I will not be interested in whom they use as a minister or who runs the governance system. My interest is what? Productivity and output. So if uh, uh, Alidu is appointed as minister of this, it doesn't matter whether he's NDC or NPP. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've had instances where we've had certain intellectuals who have been appointed by the Namadu administration, and the people have kicked against yeah. it. Yeah. I'll give you a typical example. Look at the Kumasi issue, the, the, the coordinating uh, the, uh, security, national security coordinator or whatever it is, mm. was yeah. appointed. Why was he kicked against? Because the people said that, look, he, he was not suit. part of what? Of them. So if I am a Did macho man, well? no, if I'm a macho man and I protect my small enclave from my political party and my political party win, does it automatically make me a DC, notwithstanding my competence or not? It shouldn't be. So I, 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 I believe that, look, moving forward, some of these things will, what, will change. But it, it, needs to, it needs to change now. But mm -hmm. if you look at this uh, current administration based on its appointments and stuff like that, this as if the whole situation mm -hmm. is even more aggravated. <laughs> so that Can the, I make a, sim yeah, a small well, intervention? The expectation is high. Yeah, I, okay, I, you I wanted to make a point. The, the, what we say now has to do with the fact that in, in the past, you've mentioned since the beginning of the fourth republic, mm -hmm. parties have uh, elect government. Yeah, the yes. vehicle. And, and then yeah. government abandon, abandons party completely. Yeah, I mean, then you wait till the next four years, time, mm. then you come back to them. Mm. It has cost a lot of people a lot. And even in last year's election, we're doing a project for FES. And we've gone to the other. FES is what? Frederick Ebert Foundation. Mm. In all the time regions. And that was one of the reasons that came up strongly. As being the reason why the NDC the completely abandoned the grassroots and the party structure. And, and things were going on very differently from the way it was supposed to. So you have a government uh, parallel to party, party structures. And, and w you see, when Nanagdo came to power, he said he was going to spend some time every week or every month going to the party headquarters. Because, fine, he was foreseeing that I should build this relationship or maintain this relationship, not only during elections times, but even outside the election period. Can he do that? Th th that's that's for posterity to judge. But the issue has to do with that. One way of maintaining that balance is rewarding people who have sacrificed to do the party, Within the party for you to. So you see most of the appointments coming from, from party people. But they are now realizing the, the consequence because then of, you are of breaking that the dual, structure of the party. dual relationship. So now that, that has resulted in the issuance of this thing that once you are a party person, then you, you should... should really because should other, it, so that's also going to be something because people will not think, oh, then watch that sacrifice for the party if I cannot become a, a member. But it, it's not a, a two-way thing. You but can but hold one, but you can hold both. Roland, but Dr. Lidu, the point is this. Mm. Uh, establishing a relationship with a party, right. if you happen to be in government, does not necessarily or should not be limited to just appointments. appointments. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? It should not be limited to appointments. At the end of the day, my, the point that I'm trying to make is that, look, as a country, competence should be the hallmark of appointment. Yeah. Even though 
party affiliation and party support is necessary and important. But competence should be what? Should be the hallmark. But unfortunately and quite regretfully, yeah. the reason why we have most of these problems relative to party members trying to take over what? Agencies and even having a rift, okay. as it happened between Otiku and Bugri Nabu, mm. is that we have not been able to reconscientize mm. the party people that yeah. look, governance is for the benefit of you and governance is different from party. Yeah. That mm. is that is a whole we'll problem. see how that goes. That because I know that, that I have, have some friends within the NDC as well who in the at the constituency level and they keep complaining. Yeah. No, no, no. That's that, that what I'm saying. Yeah. Look, that no, was that, yeah, making the, the, the ideal point, point. The point that I'm making is that <laughs> taking care of somebody does not yeah. necessarily. Yeah. That is, if not all of us. Because all they needed was not money. Decisions. Decisions. I think they, yeah. they wanted a constant. Recognition can take so many. You can't meet them and that kind of thing. But the president, for example, or the ministers, they have busy schedules. There's no way they'll come and meet party often, can they? Why? Why? Why shouldn't you? Why? Shouldn't you? I mean, you should make some time to do that if you're a politician, right? You understand what I'm saying? You that, that's the vehicle yeah. that brought you to power. We have five minutes. Let's okay. look at this. Um, <laughs> we have some nominees for the position of uh, Chief Justice because the current Chief Justice will be retiring next year. Uh, Sophia Kufo's name is Justice Sophia Kufo. Uh, she's also with the Supreme Court. And then we have uh, Justice uh, Doche and then Enini Yabwa. I, I, I take your view on, on these three individuals. Uh, personally, I don't have so much information about them, and mm. but I assume there's a laid down procedure by which they, they can get to the president to appoint consultations, maybe is that the Ghana Bar or legal, whatever, legal counsel or whatever. There should be recommendations and to do and that. And the down, president also does lay, that through the council of, in consultation with the council of state. But I, I, what I, the point I want to make is that the person that's, that's appointed should be a person that, that's able to deliver, that's able to look at the collective interests of the state, rather than the government or the president that has appointed him or her. And then if you're able to do that, we move forward. In the developed world, pan, uh, political, what is it? Presidents or party leaders appoint these people, but they still use the law and, and provide justice, make justice accessible to everybody that comes under the umbrella term of the judiciary. If we are able to but do that. But in the United States, um, a justice is known to be a Republican, very conservative, and the Republicans are conservative. Yes, but 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 and, but if and, and they know that, that if there's a particular issue before them, this is how they're going to think. Yes, you you can have a, a ideological point of view that is either in in confirmation or contradiction to the government that appoints you or the government of the day. But I still believe at the end of the day, they use the law, fairness, and they make sure that everybody is supposed to be protected under them. That is what is very important in this uh, portfolio. I've, I've, I've followed the debate mm. uh, for some time. And in fact, two names happen to be popping up, uh, Doche and Eni Yeboah. Uh, today we have uh, Sophia Kufu. Uh, I mean, you mean somebody's lobbying? Uh, like, well, let, let because me finish. In Ghana, <laughs> in Ghana. By, by the close of the news day yesterday, Sophia Kufu's name. Yeah, yeah, in Ghana today, I mean, you know that when it comes to these issues, people intentionally or consciously <laughs> we bring to our names day. Yeah. But you see, the point is this, uh, Roland. I happen to have had the opportunity to be in the States when uh, Justice Roberts was appointed, appointed by, yeah. by, by Bush. Yeah. Interestingly, he was appointed as a Supreme Court Justice. And during that time, the Chief Justice, there was so much controversy. During that time, the Chief Justice, I think, passed on or stepped down. Then he nominated him for the Chief Justice of the what? The Supreme Court of the United States. The point that I'm trying to make is that in countries like the United States, Bush, for instance, touted one of his successes as being the appointment of what? The Chief Justice. So it's a very, very important position. <laughs> to the extent that the president says that, look, one of my achievements as being the president is that I appointed Dr. Elidu as this. So it tells you the competence of this individual. The Chief Justice has a very, very important role to play when it comes to the governance system of a country. And in fact, the forward march of what? A country. In the sense that the Supreme Court, like it or hate it, is a policy formulation institution. Mm -hmm. Even though it adjudicates on what? On issues. But it's a policy formulation and gives direction regarding where the country should go. So I'm interested in knowing what is the profile of these individuals. Profile in terms of what they think, their vision, their conduct. Their ideological orientation. Unfortunately, we're not. We're we not are giving not giving that. that. In you the remember, United States, you remember the Amas Aramiyao case with the, yes. the, 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 the justice system. Mm -hmm. In fact, based on the findings of Amas, the justice system, as a matter of fact, was totally broken. Mm -hmm. 
in disarray. It was in disarray under the leadership of somebody. Like it or hate it, under the leadership of somebody or under the leadership of a number of what justices. This was where we are. What are these people coming to do to solve the system? I mean, you can't have a country that looks forward to development without a strong what? Judiciary. Judiciary. Mm -hmm. That is the pillar and foundation upon which a country. So the, the, this whole issue about the chief justice, the way it's being managed, to be honest, I'm not happy about it. In I mean, the United States, you have some of these justices in the Supreme Court, and they, their publications are well read yes. and known. They make their opinion. Is. Of course, they of course. may not go to the mainstream yeah, media and be speaking yeah, yeah. like the way um, our, our own do. Yes, our own. <laughs> yeah. You just no. They they, they 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 have outlets by which their opinions are read by the academia, mm. by normal legal practitioners, by they the media, etc. Do you understand? Websites. So, they, they, they are positions based on how they need to be. Um, playing a role within the context of freedom of speech is well known. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's, it's, it's in some obscurity. Is there a disincentive in that, for us making an opinion about who yeah. is this and who is that? You see, the, the importance of this institution is, uh, is underscored by Doc. But I think what, what is also important is that the judiciary has the power to even declare the decision and actions of the president sure. unconstitutional. Not how and powerful void. they are. So they are powerful. Not well, and well. void. So they have that power. So the issue is that a, a president will necessarily want to appoint somebody <laughs> that will be able to support him or her. It's, or a, it's, a, it's a logical it's, it's, it's a logical thing because of this whole concept of checks and balances. Do you understand? But me, my caution is, it's a political reality. But in as, in as much as we have to face that reality, we should not sacrifice competence for the reality. The person that's supposed to be appointed, it's a political decision, but it should be somebody who will be able to dispense and lead justice in this country, regardless of your party colors or the language you speak or the religion that you practice. There, there, there's nothing wrong with the president appointing somebody who more or less lean towards his ideological orientation. But what I'm saying is that we need to know these individuals. We need to know them better than what we know. Yeah. Justice Sufaya Kufu had been at the Supreme Court yeah, or the CV, bench. Yeah, CV, etc. But yeah, you, I mean, you feel it's not enough. It's not enough. We need to have a profile of, uh, I mean, their orientation. I mean, their rulings. What informed their rulings? I mean, where do they see they are going to take this country? Of course. I mean, they've been in the system for quite some time. They've written some opinions. They've written some papers and stuff like that. We need to know much about them. And even if possible, I mean, there should be a vetting procedure even probably in Parliament. <laughs> all of that. And, and then, what do they call it? Justice Roberts. When I, I happened to be there to watch And you him. watched him? Yeah. He was, they have a Senate Select Committee on Vision or whatever it is. And he was, he was asking a number of questions. Shall I go on to ask? I think we need to do it's something like that. We need to move beyond just what and, we are doing. Uh, I've had two members of the academia here today. Uh, Dr. Alidu Seidu. Uh, with the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana. Thanks for joining me, Alidu. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Ahmed Jinapo, also with the University of Education, whatever. And thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, sir. All right.